Thank you so much, Nomsa. Uh, a really beautiful take on a woman who, against so many odds and indescribable suffering, stayed so true and rooted to her culture. Uh, to me, she seems to be someone who just embodied that inner strength and fortified spirit of African women. So thank you for sharing what is essentially her memory and her legacy. Thank you also for helping us to see that African art and culture has as much a part to play in resistance and transformation um, as any other part of the liberation struggle. So the chapter two was a very gentle, poignant and fascinating read. I really did enjoy it and I enjoyed your presentation also. I'm very happy we got to actually hear some music towards the end as well. Okay, so now we'll move swiftly on to the next segment of our event. Uh, Nomsha and I will be in conversation for another 20 minutes or so. Um, just unpicking some of the key themes from Miriam's life and her chapter in the book. So once that is over, it will then be time for the Q&A. In that segment, you'll get the opportunity to ask your questions directly to Nomsa, or if you prefer, you can pitch them in the chat for me to field them on your behalf. All I ask is that you stay on mute until the time comes for you to speak. And when that time comes, I'll ask you to raise your virtual hand and wait until you are called. Okay, so before then, however, I do want to kick off our conversation also with my first question, uh, which is, I wanted to ask you, what is it that you believe was central to the wide appeal and impact that Miriam McCabe had and still actually has? Um, what I think, um, thank you, I, I really love that question, because I think from where we started, I started speaking about how crossing boundaries, crossing cultures, and just having a deeper understanding of people. So I think in spirit, she was just an open spirit who was open to learn about different people from different places. And um, I think that's what made her most appealing. So crossing over, crossing divides, whether it was spiritual, being, you know, like the daughter of a Sangoma, whether it was embracing her African, her mother's spiritual culture, or embracing Christianity, I think it was a spirit that she was open with um, always. And I think that's what made her, um, her that, that versatility and openness of spirit is what um, is probably, probably the most powerful trait of hers. And being that open-minded and being that when someone is that open-minded to other people's different experiences, they different, they, I think always attract different experiences, which is why she could travel so much and be embraced in so many different places and sing in so many different languages. She'd go to a different country, she'd learn a language of the people and she'd learn how to sing a song. And I think that quality, you know, how do we cross those divides? How do we cross those cultures? I think that quality is the most enduring quality about her. And I think that's why her name still resonates today. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Um, speaking of languages, you did write in the chapter about uh, Miriam using language as a statement uh, and also her refusal to sing in Afrikaans. So do you think that we need a greater emphasis on our indigenous languages, both in African countries and the diaspora as well? Yes, um, I actually, yes, no, that um, the, the language is, issue, especially in South Africa, um, Afrikaans, it was a language of the colonizer. It was a language used by the apartheid. The whole language issue, issue was what caused the Soweto uprising in 1976. School children went out onto the streets and they protested against being taught in languages in Afrikaans specifically. And, you know, that was, that became a turning point of the liberation struggle in South Africa, this rejection of being, of having languages imposed on us. But I think one 
again, it's about it's how we look at languages. We have to be realistic. While we've got our indigenous languages, we also need to have languages where we are able to communicate. Language is about communicating. How do we cross the divide? We can't be precious and say, this is, I only speak my indigenous language. As people, we have to be able to cross those divides and cross bridges. But I think as a sense of identity and as a sense of history, and as a sense of knowing where we come from, there's some value in retaining our own indigenous languages or passing them on to our kids. But in terms of greater bridging of bridges and communicating, some languages have to be to use. But um, back to just Miriam in the case of um, Miriam uh, Makeba and Afrikaans, that was a definite statement. She was not going to sing in Afrikaans and give the apartheid government the benefit in their culture. So I think that was the main point she was making. Um, how would you describe the importance of music in liberation struggles? You did write a bit about this in the book. How would you kind of go into that a bit further in terms of how important music is within that regard? Because throughout history, we've seen music play a role in various kind of times of conflict and, and liberation struggle. Um, yes, of course, I think music as well is, um, again, like I think I tried to put across in the, in the conversation is that music is such a universal language. You don't have to understand um, someone's language to appreciate a song. A song can have so much power. But song, music and song is also a very fast way to get messages across to people. We don't all write, you know, not everybody writes. You can't all write a book, but you can sing a song and in a few minutes you can express yourself, put forward expressions of love, of anger, of loss, of grieving. It's such a powerful language, music, and used correctly can really build bridges and build brown, bow, I mean, cross bridges. Again, you know, I think this whole theme of crossing bridges and breaking down boundaries, I think is like what part of this, um, I think lecture series is about, or at least that's how I felt in contributing to it, is that we know so little about each other, or we know so little about our history, and we know so little about um, culture enough. So the more that we can share with it's through books, Yes, we can. But music, like I say, is just a more succinct way of getting word and messages across to each other. Yeah. And just in terms of our past, um, I think, um, well, in the early days of the struggle for liberation, the early Pan-Africanists, I know a lot of one of the a lot of the early initiatives, like which I tried to mention, uh, having Pan-African festivals, you know, collaborations platforms where artists from different parts of the continent could get together. That is still a powerful medium for people to engage. Culture and music are such powerful tools for people to get to know each other. Sorry, I think we lost you towards that's, the end. You know, so lost. that's the value I find in music, yeah? Okay. I just said so, the whole history of having cultural festivals where music is central to that is a very important and powerful way for people to get to know each other and communicate. Build unity. So do you, would you say then as Pan-African arts? Are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Mm. Yes, I can. You can? Okay. Sorry, did I interrupt? No, no. You do. I think we're just lagging behind each other. Oh, oh gosh. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> Difficult. Um, no, I was going to say, leading on from that then, do you think that as Pan-Africanists, we should perhaps focus a little more on, on culture and the arts as a means to 
galvanize people. Yes, I definitely think you, the, the use of culture, the arts, you know, any exchanges we can have are critical to how we begin to understand each other or how we begin to collaborate or how we begin to cross cultures and cross those divides. So I think the more cultural festivals, the more into in inter exchanges we have, the more plat I think the better it is for whatever higher, higher, I don't know if that's the right word, of whatever deeper uh, levels of communication we need to have. Um, the arts and culture re are really important tools for getting to know each other. And, you know, we also live in a time well, obviously this age, you know, this whole Zoom world that we are in, where with access to the technologies that we have, you know, collaborated and communicating doesn't have to be as difficult as it was before. So these are all opportunities where people could have more platform. Uh, sorry, okay, sorry, I just saw somebody's message, <laughs> an alternative to Zoom. But... Um, Yes, I think I think I think definitely um, more the more platforms they are, the better it would be for 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 us. And culture is a good starting stone towards um, and unity or understanding each other. Mm. Thank you. So, mm. was there um, a point in her life where you feel that it became clear her focus had widened from? the apartheid struggles in South Africa to African liberation more broadly. Is there a time in her career where it was kind of clear to see that that had become the case? Yes, um, I definitely think, um, as I tried in the presentation, I tried to explain a bit, that in her early years of um, exile, when she first landed in America in the early 1960s, Miriam Makeba, when she was denied her right to go to return to go back to her country, it was the African community, or it was the African community that embraced her. It was people from different parts of the continent who were also away from their own countries, who formed a commu community of Africans in exile. But it wasn't only just Africans with the Black American communities who were also fighting as this was the height of the civil rights movement when she landed um, in America in 1960. There was a whole sense that the only way that we can overcome injustices is if we work together and we collaborate. So I think that whole opening was not just like in seeing herself as a South African coming from a disadvantaged background but seeing the larger picture that as Africans, as black people, no matter where we're from, if we work together and we're fighting to, towards a common goal, we can solve a lot of problems a lot faster and a lot more effectively and a lot more, well, sustainably. They don't use, they didn't use that word then, but you know, there's a longer term plan. If there's unity in mind, then people can plan with greater focus um and build things that last instead of short-term things so i think yes from her early days in america and just having a community of acceptance and people you know i think there's a lot of things that we have people have in common culturally and i think she she found that um and i think that's what made her able to look at the struggle for freedom as not just being a struggle for freedom in South Africa, but a continental thing. And not only a continental thing, but a global thing. The freedom of women and the freedom of black women, the freedom of white, you know, the freedom of all peoples. Yeah. I think that was her spirit and her energy. 
Because how was it she described herself? Was it a global citizen or a citizen of the, of the world? Of the yes, no, definitely. Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. She, did, she definitely reached um, the status of being a citizen of the world, a global citizen. And I, mean, I think something just as um, Maria, that you know, when you travel, you meet people. So um, I think traveling with an open mind, and like I said, that was, I think, the, one of the most um, powerful uh, traits about um, it's in life when we open us so much more. So I think that's what she did. So yeah. yes, she was definitely a citizen of the world. So the title Mama yeah. Africa stretches a bit beyond that. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, mm. So how was she being this, this citizen of the world? How was Makeba able to influence perceptions of Africa in the wider world? Mm. Well, I think she just, um, I really think she just did it practically, just pride, just pride in herself. So um, just, well, just in how do you embrace your own identity? The way she looked, the way she dressed, the way she spoke, you know, I think just that confidence that we in certain places, if we are confident enough about who we come from, about our sense of culture, it's easy for us to, to speak out and to stand strong. If we have, and I think maybe um, I'm going to just take this just a bit away and just talk about this project, mm -hmm. um, that the, the book, the Pan Pantheon series, the Pan-African Pantheon, that I think if we don't have a, a strong sense of history and a strong sense of identity and a strong sense of who we are, it's easy to lose ourselves and to be swayed and to latch on to anything new that comes our way. But I think Miriam Makeba was rooted, was strong in her roots of I'm an African and this is where I come from. And I came from, and I think it came from just the cultural roots of, of coming from a strong culture of whether it was from her parents or whether it was coming from there or whether it was from her ancestral and spiritual side. And I think the challenge that we might have as people going forward is if we don't even know the history of where we've come from as Africans or where our struggle has been and who were the leaders. I know just even in myself reading the contributions of other women in this book um, that I, you know, like a journey or some, you know, like some of the women who are mentioned in the book, I know that it's given me more determination to read more about other women, to write more about other women who've come before me. And I think that gives one a strength of, a sense of purpose and a strength, strength sense of pride. And I think that's what Miriam had, uh, knowing where she came from and being proud of that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Just. Mm. Okay, so just to finish off in just one moment, but so my life should be remembered. How how would you like her to be remembered? I would like her to be remembered as somebody as a woman of courage. Um, a woman who stood up for her beliefs and for her convictions, a woman who um, stood by truth. She saw injustice in front of her and she had the courage to stand up and say a situation was unjust, even a detriment to herself at different stages of her life, you know, whether she lost. And also that very important um, quality as not only an artist, but um, just an individual, having the integrity to stand up for what you believe in and seeing it through to the end. And I think that's what she did. So I really want her to be remembered as a woman of courage and a woman who stood by her convictions. But beyond that, um, you know, something I didn't mention as part of her legacy, even after her career was done, yes, she was still performing until the day she died. 
but behind the scenes, um, she wasn't just talking about people's rights on a surface. In her personal life and as an individual, um, something she did when she came back from um, exile, when she was finally home, she set up a center, a rehabilitation center for girls in South Africa. And um, with this home, using her own resources and with funding from everywhere she went, um, she she's established a center for abused and abandoned girls. So she wasn't just doing a talk about the rights of women or the rights of you know, black people or improving our society. She actually did something practical and tangible, which is a thing that, you know, each one of us can do. You know, you don't just go, go out and stage and say, oh, our freedoms, our freedoms, whatever it is. She really gave back and at her center, she contributes, you know, like the children, the young girls at her center get a place to stay, but she also contributes to their education. So that was somebody who really put her heart and her energy, her mouth, you know, her, you know, her money where her mouth is, whatever it is, however you say it. Yeah. So those, those, those are the things that I really like, really hope people remember about her, that she didn't just sing, she was a woman of action and she made things tangible and she made things work. Yeah. So if there's anything to remember, I think that's an enduring part of her legacy. Yeah. And the center's there. And the center's seen lots of girls go through it. And she's going to change lots of people's lives. She's beyond her life. Other young uh, women have got an opportunity. And that's beautiful. That's amazing.